Hi guys, I appreciate you taking the time to join me uh, for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're going to be starting a new Bible study on the book of James. So we're going to start in James chapter 1, and uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8 tonight. Uh, my name is David List. I'm the pastor at Impact Church in Wilson, North Carolina, and so glad that you joined us. Before we get started in the Word, let's take just a moment and invite the Holy Spirit into this process. We'll ask God to guide us through His Word. So let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is uh, encouragement, it is strength, it gives us guidance and things that we didn't even know. But Lord, those words that were written many years ago are still alive and are speaking to us today. So as we read the, these passages today, these eight verses, Lord, speak to our hearts, speak to our lives, and give us the strength and guidance we need to live this life we've been called to. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, let's go ahead and start out with verse 1. Um, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. I'm not sure which version you have, but you may see some similarity. I may explain some things that your Bible already has. But in verse 1, uh, we two, see two things introduced. Number one, the author. We also see introduced who it is that he's writing to, he's, who he's specifically writing to. So it starts out, it says, James a bondservant of God, some versions say a slave, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes that which are scattered abroad. Greetings, he says. So this is the opening greeting of the book. But let's give a little bit of background. James, that is speaking to us here, uh, you may or may not know this, but he is actually the, the brother of Jesus. Um, Jesus being the firstborn of Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Um, but afterwards, Joseph and Mary had other children. So I've never really thought of it this way, but Jesus grew up in a household where he was an elder brother to siblings. And uh, we know from biblical record that he at least had four brothers, four brothers that are named, and possibly even another one that we don't have the name from. So there could have been five brothers. And then at least two girls, because it mentions his sisters in plural, but it does not give their names. So this is the brother of Jesus. Isn't it interesting how he starts off and he says the bondservant or the slave, a bondservant was normally one who had gone beyond the indenturement of, of slavehood and decides to, with their own will and intention, to continue to serve their master. So he's identifying himself uh, who is a slave or a bondservant of God. He has committed himself to the service of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, he is talking about one who is his brother with regards to household, but one that he has acknowledged as being the Lord then he mentions Jesus, and then he mentions his mission, purpose, and anointing as the Christ. So James doesn't even say, I'm the brother. He says he's a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, which I think speaks a lot of him. And he's addressing to uh, different translations, word this just a little bit differently to try to clarify, but it says to the 12 tribes of, uh, some versions say, of believers who are scattered um, abroad, and then he just says simply greetings. Let's go on to verse 2. And some of you may read this and say, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for that. But he says, my brethren, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. What bus did he just jump off of? It says here, count it all joy be excited about it. Be all joy, happy about it. When you fall into various trials, tests, a good biblical word for this, a good translation would be the word proving. It is not that something has come for your destruction, but the intention here is that you're going through something, you have been allowed to go through something, but it is to prove how strong you are in the Lord, how you have been strengthened. The enemy may be coming against you, but the reality is that what you're going to find out through all this is just how strong you've become in the Lord and how strong the Lord is in you. So he says, count it all joy. So 
It may be a stretch for you, but get excited about it when you go through tough times. And let's just look at it a little bit. When you, it says, knowing that the testing, this trial or this, this struggle of your faith produces patience. I want to define just a few words there. Firstly, let's go back and look at the testing and the trial. Uh, I'm getting warm. I'm going to undo some of this. If you think about, let's say you had in your mind that you wanted to run a marathon or that you were going to have to run in a marathon and you didn't even realize that you needed to go there. Uh, how many of you be excited about showing up and all of a sudden being told, you have to run a marathon today? I wouldn't be excited about it. You know why? Because I'm way far out of shape from being able to run a marathon. I don't think there's ever been a time in my life when I was in good enough shape to run a marathon, even when I was fit. But um, here, what if you decided that you were going to go out and walk a mile today? Well, that may be a stretch for you, but if you walk a mile for a while, you'll find out that you can overcome that mile, and then you might extend it to two. Or what if all of a sudden all those energetic juices get going and you start stretching and you start jogging three miles or then you start jogging five miles and as you stretch and press your flesh, you, you, you stretch your body and your abilities by a greater um, perseverance for endurance, you move, move forward, you develop your ability to endure that test, that trial, that physical strain to the point where finally you are equipped. You may not be aware of it, but one day when you run that marathon, you realize, hey, I can do this. And then your, your pursuit becomes, how can I do it quicker? How can I do it better? I don't know if you've got that kind of determination in your life, but what if you're weightlifting? I know one thing, if I needed someone to pick up something that was heavy, I wouldn't want to call on the person who never ad attempted to lift anything. I would want to look around for the person who was a, a, a weightlifter. I saw today where in the what they call the jerk and clean lift category that the, the in the heavyweight category the world current world record i believe is 352 pounds i could not lift 352 pounds even if i tried but somebody persevered and they went through a daily battle with their flesh a daily battle with some weight and have strengthened themselves to the point to where they stand on top of the world in that record category because they can lift 352 pounds. But they didn't get there by doing nothing. They overcame daily challenges and worked at it until they could. Well, look, if all we have with, a spiritual, with regard to spiritual life is uh, a, a recliner mentality, would Lord just make it easy for me? And by the way, would you, would you pass the popcorn around every once in a while? Instead of taking on some challenges and stretching our spiritual muscles and getting stronger in our faith by our study of the Word and by uh, when challenges come, that we stand in the faith and, and use the tools that God's given us, we grow stronger that way. And he says here that knowing that the reason why we can have joy even when we face um, uh, trials or tests, the enemy sends a test your way, life just sends you a test. We can have joy in it because we know that that deposit that's been put inside of us, the faith that we can have in God's Word, the fact that we've got a relationship with God will provide the resources that we need to be able to overcome that challenge, test, and trial. And we can have faith in God in that. And as we overcome it, we will have the ability to rejoice. Yeah, I won. I'm the winner. And celebrate what God's done in our life and celebrate that thing that once would have beaten me, that thing that would have torn me up for a week. Now it doesn't overcome me to that degree. Now I can see that I've made steps forward. My faith has grown. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So let me explain this word patience here. Um, and and uh, I, I, it, it's, the word patience means it it will accomplish or develop, and the word patience is steadfastness, endurance, or perseverance. It will give you the ability to stand against, stand in the fight, to be able to endure till the end, to be able to overcome. Why? Because patience has been developed in you. And it says, going on to verse 4, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may 
may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let's stop right there for just a minute. But let patience, we talked about that steadfast endurance, the perseverance, have its perfect work. That perfect work there literally means to be perfected or to mature or to complete. So as patience that comes from us standing in our faith, uh, it, it permeates our being. It works through our system. What's ending, what is happening inside of us is that we are growing up and being made mature in our faith. We are growing stronger. Our endurance is there. And we're able to take on more and accomplish more for the Lord. That little bit of weight no longer overwhelms you. It takes a, a bigger, heavier thing. And not only that, you have risen to the challenge. You are able to take on the next level and accomplish more, overcome more. You know, there may be things that you've been battling in your life for some time. And every time you even think about it, it already defeats you when, it, when you're, you, you emotionally or in your thought life, you even go there. Well, let me tell you, you were not designed to be beaten by those things. God has equipped you to be an overcomer, that you would be victorious in life. So my prayer for you is that, that God would continue to strengthen you in your faith, that you would stand on God's word, stand on you, your relationship with God and your experiences in the faith, and that God would bring you victory over those things. They would not have mastery over you. So that you would, it says here that it would have its, its perfect work, you'd be made complete, that you may be perfect and complete. The word complete there means that the outcome of the test, the final uh, declaration or proof that is, is displayed at the end is that there is no blemish and no defect in you that you see that that thing did not beat you, it did not destroy you, it did not stop you, that there is no blemish or defect, there's no lack, that you have been made complete, that you are lacking nothing. Let's go on to verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it, and it will be given to him. So it says, look, if you need wisdom. So what's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Knowledge is just the accumulation of information. But wisdom is taking what you do have and knowing how to respond, how to act in, in the appropriate time. So you may not have all the knowledge and knowledge puffs up, but there are people that are very knowledgeable and have no common sense as to how to apply that knowledge. Wisdom gives the ability to know what to do, how to act in the appropriate way. If you lack understanding of how to do that, it says here to ask God. And it's, it describes him as the God who gives liberally and without reproach. Let's look at that. So he gives liberally. He gives with liberality. In other words, he is glad to give you not just a little bit, but all that you need and more. God is looking to do that. Have you asked him? Have you been pursuing God and asking for, for wisdom? And he says, without reproach, look, there's no shame in coming to God and saying, God, I don't know what to do. I need your wisdom and your insight for this situation. There's no shame in that. Matter of fact, we're instructed to do that. If you lack, then ask. And it says, and it will be given to you. Verse 6 said, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. The waves of the sea have no control over their direction. The currents of the ocean, the wind, a storm can come up and, and push things back and, and, and cause the water to be, to be uh, pushed together and dammed up in certain areas. But we're not like that. It says when we ask, let's ask in faith believing. Look, if you're a child of God, you've got a relationship with God and you have the right to make requests. So don't doubt when you ask. Anticipate that it's coming. Why ask the question, then automatically start thinking, well, I don't know if God will hurt. Here's my prayer. I don't know why he would answer me. God doesn't really love me as much as anybody else. That's not the way to approach God. Approach God with expectation and faith that he will answer your prayer. Then going on to verse 7, let, For let not a man suppose that he will receive anything from God. That's if we ask double-minded. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So it's encouraging us here once again that when we ask, 
we shouldn't be double-minded. We shouldn't be uh, questioning whether or not God will answer. It says that if we're that way, then, then we're probably not going to receive anything. It says that kind of person is double-minded. You can't even get your thoughts going in one direction. You can't stay on one path. Um, how do you walk down a, 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 a split in the road or drive down a split in the road? You're going to have to choose one or the other. So you can either take the faith path or you can take the doubt path. I, I'm choosing to take the faith path, and I want to encourage you to do that with us. I, the, a big thing that stands out to me in this whole passage is that God is committed to our personal development. He does not want us to be defeated by the circumstances of life. When circumstances come that we don't understand, his intention is for us to grow stronger in that and to see his deliverance. Not only that, if we don't know how to act, he encourages us to walk in relationship to him by asking for wisdom. And God will be glad to liberally, completely give us what we need and without reproach. We don't have to be ashamed about it. I'm going to close in prayer. The Lord bless you. We look forward to seeing you on the Zoom meeting. If you need that link, send it to us. Send us a message and we'll send that over to you. Lord bless all these that watch this little brief video tonight. Thank you for your word, God, because it's so encouraging to us. I just want to speak blessing over every household out there. Lord, I know that you have us in the palm of your hand if we're your children, and God, that you love us. And uh, Lord, you're walking out life with us, and we thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you have any questions or have any needs, please call us so that we can pray with you, counsel you, and, and, and point you in the right direction. God bless. Bye-bye.